So Juliette, I'm glad you're here. You remember the advice you gave me on my bookmark application? Uh, no, what was it? Uh, to migrate towards Unit 5. Oh, right. You Did know what? you try it? Yeah, but it doesn't work at all. What? <laughs> I saw that the last version is the 5.5, .5, if I am not wrong. Yes. And you will right. see that it doesn't even oh. compile. Yes. You cannot find the artifact inside the repository. What the heck? That's weird. Um, well, did you read the documentation before trying that? Uh, let's say that I saw that it was the 5.5, .5, so I tried first to um, upgrade the version to see what was not compiling to start the migration. Yeah, of course. Uh, but maybe you should have read it. Oh. Uh, so if you did, uh, you, w you would have learned that uh, this dependency, so JUnit JUnit, actually does not exist anymore. Okay. I mean, it doesn't have a fifth uh, version. Because, uh, so the goal uh, in, uh, behind uh, JUnit 5 was to uh, separate the concert a bit. So they decided to split this dependency into three new modules. So um, here, since you want to migrate your old uh, JUnit 4 project into JUnit 5, the first uh, dependency you should ha add is uh, JUnit Vintage. So as you can guess uh, with the name, it will uh, allow you to run your old JUnit 4 tests, even if you don't have the JUnit 4 dependency anymore. OK, so that's yes. it's so basically you can now uh, run your build again, and it should work as before. So the um, useful thing about this is that uh, you can actually um, keep this dependency as long as you want. So if you don't want to migrate your whole project uh, at once, you can do it uh, bit by bit. OK, fine. So now, uh, if you uh, want to write your new JUnit 5 tests, uh, you ha have to add the JUnit Jupyter dependency. So it will contain all the new annotations and uh, features uh, <laughs> that you need to write your tests. OK. And why do they call that Jupyter? Well, it's because uh, so it's JUnit 5, and Jupyter is the fifth planet from the sun. So OK, makes sense. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Why are you laughing? You're waiting for the seventh version, maybe? Uh, okay, so uh, the third dependency I was talking about is uh, JUnit Platform. Okay. Uh, so it's it will, uh, I mean, it's the test engine, so it will discover and launch the tests. But here you don't have to import it uh, explicitly, because it will be pulled uh, by the the other ones. OK, transitively. Okay. Yes, exactly. So um, OK, we're done for the, the dependencies. And the last uh, thing you need to check here is the Maven Surefire plugin. Okay. So it has to be uh, a version greater than 2.22, because it's the first uh, compatible version with uh, JUnit 5. Fine. So now we can migrate a test yes, to our Yes, you're device. all set to migrate your project now. OK, so let's start with this one. How should I proceed? Uh, OK, so here, the first uh, thing you have to do is to change the lifecycle annotations. Like this one? Uh, yes. Uh, so <coughs> before class, uh, it was a bit technical, so they changed it to before all. Um, next, uh, I guess, yes, you have a before, so now it became uh, before each. OK, that's uh, more explicit. Yes, uh, so the same thing uh, happened to after. After each, I assume? Yes, after all, but you don't, uh, well, <laughs> the uh, after no class one. is now after all, but you don't have one. Um, OK, so the test annotation uh, stays the same. But uh, you have to be careful here, because if you look at your imports, you will see that uh, the new annotations are coming from Jupyter API, uh, and you will have to import uh, tests from there as well. OK. So it will not work if you have JUnit 4 and JUnit 5 uh, annotation in the same class. OK, so from Jupyter API, you say? Yes. Oh. 
Do you know why all my public keywords are now a light in yellow? Yes, it's because you actually don't have to specify the public scope anymore, so you can remove it from your uh, methods and classes. Okay, so it's a bit lighter. Fine. Um, okay, so moving on, we have the ignore annotation. Uh, so now it's disabled. Disabled. Yes, uh, okay, and I see that you have a JUnit assertion at the end. So this one is now coming from uh, the assertions uh, class from the Jupyter package as well. So I think we're done for <coughs> this one. Okay, let's see, let's see. I, I just started the, the test. Yay. Fine. So the first test in Junit 5. You just migrate and migrated your first test ever. But tell me something. They didn't create a major version just to rename some packages and some annotation, right? Yeah, no, of course. Um, so there is a bit more to it. Um, so for instance, uh, I just said that assertion uh, have been moved. So there is also a few new ones. Okay. Um, so, for example, how did you manage to test your exceptions uh, in JNIT4? I think I have an example here. Uh, yes, so I was using a JNIT4 rule. Okay. Uh, well, uh, rules do, does not, don't exist anymore in JNIT5, so you will have to remove them from your... Uh, tests and here, uh, if you want to replace it, you have a new assert throws uh, annotate uh, exception assertion. Exception. Sorry, uh, exception. and it will do basically the same here. Uh, you just have to yes, this one just have to pass the uh, exception you're waiting for. Okay, so and the, uh, the code that's supposed to throw it in the form of a lambda. Okay, so the code that is supposed to throw yeah, the exception this one. is that, by the way. Uh, oh, I have a fly that is flying <laughs> right around my head. Annoying. Yeah, that's a bit annoying. <laughs> and I think I'm set. Uh, yes. I uh, just have to make sure the test comes from the right oh, package. Yeah, good catch. You're learning fast. Like that. Okay, so that's all? Yes, um, so it should uh, do exactly the same. Yes, cool. And uh, if you want to perform uh, additional checks on your exception, like uh, the message, uh, you can uh, retrieve the exception from the, yes, the assertion like that. Okay, and I will be able to check the message and the cause and so mm. on. Great. Okay, um, so there is another new assertion I quite like, and I think you could um, make use of it here. So in the first test, you have several assertions. Mm, yes. Uh, so the issue you can have here, here is uh, if the first assertion is failing, the following ones will not be executed. <laughs> yes, right? that's true. Well, now you have a, a new assertion, which is assert all. And if you use it to, to wrap all your existing assertions, it will make sure uh, every, I mean, every assertions are executed, even if there is uh, multiple failure cases. Okay, and, and I have to provide them as, as a list of uh, lambdas? Yes, okay. you're right. So uh, let's... Me, let's uh, do some refactoring there. It has to be, oops, uh, lambda, as we said, uh, list. So let's get that particular. Yes. Oh, if I, I may do this like that. Uh, and all those I, I have to just to wrap up in the asset all. Yes. Awesome. Okay. And you just said that, in fact, it's performing a kind of soft assertion, right? Yes. So That's if it. I make sure it will fail for the name, for example, and for the tags as well, it should report all the cases at once. Yes. Okay, so let's That's see. It. Okay, we have the report for the name here and the report for the tag as well. Hey. That's a great feature because you know sometimes when you are doing a huge refactoring, uh, and you have several assertions failing, you won't know it, and you will have to unstack all of those. Uh, 
Yeah, so we will, uh, that can be handy in those uh, yes. times. Um, okay, well, I just have a quick question here. Yes. Uh, it seems that uh, bookmark is a value object in your code, right? Yes, that's true. It belongs to my domain. Um, I guess you have overridden the equals and the hash code methods? Yes, but what's your point about that? You didn't seem to test them here? Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, I imagine that automatically <coughs> generated them and I forgot to write those tests. I know it can be important <coughs> when you are using maps and so on, but that's such an uh, annoying yeah. test to write. I know, I tend to forget it uh, also. So here I may have a solution for you, okay. uh, if, I, if I may. Go ahead. Um, so now in JNIT5, we have uh, the ability to create tests on an interface. So what could we do here? Uh, I can create an interface, which is called uh, equality tests, like this. I'm going to make it generic. And here I'm going to do um, some magic. Oh, you're and coding so fast. Yes. Uh, so I have implemented two tests, uh, one for the equality, one for the inequality. So the implementation is uh, pretty straightforward. And I'm using two uh, abstract methods here because I don't actually have the um, the way to provide values. Yeah. Yes, mm. because we're on interface. Um, by the way, we are using default methods because uh, I can't do uh, otherwise. Uh, and um, okay, so here I'm done with the interface. And what I have to do is just come back to my test, implement uh, the interface. So here, of course, we're interested in uh, the equality between bookmarks. And I just have to implement the the two abstract uh, method how I were using I was using in my uh, tests. So here I'm gonna provide a uh, bookmark, uh, so a random um, value, and in this one another. So I guess if I change the uh, URL, it will be enough yeah, to, to be make different. them different. Okay, so now if I run the whole test, the yes, the whole class again, you see that I now have two additional um, tests, and they are not uh, implemented in my class. Oh, great! So now if I have another object and I want to test equality, I just have to implement the equality test. Yes, and place it on the the object. So I want. you will not forget it again. Yeah, and I also see another great use case. For example, when you have a business interface with several implementation, you can verify the same contract, the same behavior in a test interface, and implement that yes. in all the tests of the implementation. So that's yes, great. that's really Avoid uh, powerful. To duplicate tests anyway. Exactly. <coughs> great. Um, so should we move to the other test I now? I just have another comment in this one. Okay. Um, so in the second test, you seem to be testing the invalid uh, names uh, for a bookmark. Yes. And I think you forgot one, uh, the, in the empty case. Oh, that's... But what do you have against my test today? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, I assume I've totally forgot that as well. You want me to duplicate the test to handle the empty case? Well, maybe you could have done a parameterized test here. A parameterized test? But it's so heavy for just an empty string. Well, it was in uh, JNIT4, but now uh, you can do it pretty easily. Uh -huh. If you want to try, I can yes. show you. Uh, so you just have to make the name a parameter of the test. Okay, so it has to be a parameter of the test. Yes. Like that. And uh, you're going to have to change the test annotation uh, by a parameterized test one. So now uh, parameterized tests are actually built in in Genit, so you don't have to add anything else. Okay. And uh, you're going to provide your test cases with a value source uh, annotation, so it's taking an array of the type of your choice. Okay, so, so I have to use strings here. Yes. I assume that I can provide several test cases. 
That's the point. Okay, so um, empty case, the blank case. I will add the tab as well. Well, now you will yell at me because the name of the test is not right, but okay. anyway. <laughs> and I will try the null case. Um, null is not going to work like that, but uh, you actually have a null source annotation if you want to uh, provide a null parameter. Okay, so you said null source. Yes. Oh, they also provide null and empty source that we could have used, I assume? Yeah, right. Uh, great. And that's all? Now it should be, yes, working. Ta -da. Fine. And I also assume that this is all the execution of the tests with yes, these different you're parameters. Yes, right. Mm. Right. Great. Oh, so, for example, if if in the first test, I would like uh, my URL for the creation of the bookmark to be a parameter of the test as well, mm -hmm. and the name. Uh, so you said that it has to be parameterized test. Uh, I will use the value source and... Well, here... How, how can I say that I want uh, some set of values to be injected in that parameter? Yeah, you will have a bit of a limitation here because uh, value source only supports one parameter. Okay. But don't worry, uh, you can use CSV source, which is another uh, way of providing parameters. Uh, so it's taking an array as well, but here it will only be strings and uh, each string is going to represent a whole test case. Okay. So it's uh, basically the list of all the parameters separated by commas. Okay, so the first parameter is the URL. So yes. I'm providing one. The second one Come is on. the name of the bookmark. And, uh, if you want to override the delimiter, you can. There is an attribute. Okay, fine. And if I'm adding another string, it will be another test case, I assume, as well? Yes. Okay, fine. So it's uh, pretty readable, I, I think. Let's see what will happen. And by the way, uh, if you have your test cases in uh, a real CSV file, you can use CSV file source as well. CSV file source, okay. Yes. So fine. it seems to work uh, great. Um, okay, so you see that here uh, the display is a bit ugly. You mean this? Yes. So we can actually uh, make it a bit prettier. Uh, for example, this uh, name, you can, you now can override it because, oops, there is a new uh, display name annotation. Uh, so I can use that to, um, to put a custom name. So here you could uh, put spaces and uh, special characters and everything. And there is also uh, these ones. So here, by default, the name of uh, test execution is the list of all the parameters. But you can use the name attribute from parameterized test to uh, override it. So here, I uh, should create the bookmark for, let's say, the URL. So I can use the actual value uh, here, like this. So this is the first one, so it's okay. the index uh, zero, and the name is the second one, like that. Fine. So um, let's execute my test again. Okay. okay. You see that it's now much more readable, so that's really great. That's true, but you know, I like the way we are naming our tests, and if I had to copy past the test and the name of the test and replacing the underscore and put that in the display name, I don't see the value. Yeah, well, okay, so I see your point, uh, but here you could do uh, something else, so you could remove this display name. And you actually have the ability to generate uh, them automatically. So here at the class level, I can put a uh, display name generation annotation. And I have to choose a strategy for it. So here I happen to have a replace underscores one, uh, which uh, I guess will uh, satisfy you. So if I run it again, yeah, it's still there. But I will have to do that on all the tests. Well, <laughs> if you want to register this uh, 
generator globally, you can. Um, so you just have to go inside your POM uh, to the, the uh, Maven Surefire plugin here. And you can configure it so that it passes uh, an argument to JUnit, so like this. And this argument will be this one. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a great memory. So um, the I assume it's uh, inside the documentation, right? Yes, of course, <laughs> <laughs> which you didn't read. <laughs> anyway. um, so the <laughs> default uh, display name generator is now set to replace underscores. Okay. So if we come back here once again, if I run the That's whole class, oh, yes, it. right. You yeah. catch it. I remove it. I run it again. And Fine. voila. Uh, so I assume now we can move to the next test. Yes, we mm -hmm. can. Um, oh, so it's a JUnit 4 parameterized test. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Cool, I don't know, but <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a matter can, of fact. Uh, you can <laughs> use what you just learned. Yes, that's true. So, um, OK, you just said that now parameterized test is built in in JUnit 5. So at I yes. assume I can remove yeah, the runner. Yeah, you can runner. remove the runner. And uh, by the way, uh, runners uh, don't exist anymore in Genit 5. So it's the same as rules. You will have to get rid of them. OK, so, anyway, so. No, no, no runners. It has to be a parameterized test. So in the old version, we had to uh, make the parameter of the test some uh, attributes of the of the class. This yes. class. It was really annoying because of that. Uh, we had a limitation. We can't have several tests in the same class. Uh, you just said that now it can be um, parameter directly to uh, the method. Mm -hmm. So now my tag is a parameter directly here. Uh, the expected bookmarks as well, and I can get rid of those. Yes. OK, so to provide the values, I will try the CSV source. But wait a minute. Uh, yeah. Here, I'm expecting a table, uh, an array of bookmark. And as you can see, bookmark is a quite complex type. Mm -hmm. I so think it would yeah. be a nightmare to represent that in CSV, right? Yeah, it's not a good idea. But here, uh, since you're already using a method to generate your test cases, we can uh, reuse that. So there is a uh, method source annotation you can use here. And it's taking a string, which is the name of the method that's uh, generating the test cases. That's IntelliJ. Which is called okay. really uh, originally oh. test cases. OK, so it says that it will. Um, so now you can actually get rid of the parameters annotation, because uh, we already uh, pointed to it. And so yes, it was for the, the old version of GNIT. Yes. And uh, you just have to make a small change. So it has to return a stream of arguments now. Uh, arguments is a new class from uh, Jupyter, which is uh, wrapping a test case. And it has uh, a, um, what's it called? Factory. Uh, a factory method on it. So you can use that to uh, build your test cases here. OK, because it used to be a collection of array of array of objects. Yeah, quite it's ugly. It's ugly here. And as you said, now we can use that directly. So it's a trim of arguments. <laughs> And each uh, uh, <laughs> value of the parameter has to be provided in the same way, for as the same, same as the signature of the, the yes, test Yes, of method. the previous one, yes. That's so, all? So, yes, it should be all. You can try to run it. Great. Hey. So, yes, it's uh, simple. It's more simple now to write that kind of test. It's less ugly as well. <laughs> Pretty easy. Glad to hear that. Uh, assume we can move on? Yes, we uh, can. Let's try this one now. Mm. OK, so that's the data GPA test come from Spring, so I have to keep it, keep it that way. But you just said that runner no longer exists, right? Mm -hmm. But here, I need a Spring runner. I need yes, one. Yes, you still need that. Um, because it's a Spring test. 
Exactly. But here uh, you can use a new thing uh, in Genit 5, which is an extension. So in this case, uh, the uh, Spring extension will, will uh, basically do the same thing as the Spring Runner. So you can register it with extend with. And uh, so it's the Spring extension class. Okay, so it's implemented on the Spring side, side uh, of course. Nice. So before you said now it's uh, before each uh, the test, I have to make sure it comes from the right package. Yes. Uh, yeah. So and you know that since uh, the public are now yellow, <laughs> uh, and that's all right. Let's see if we still have the spring context because I like that. <laughs> yes, we yes, have. Yes, it. it's fine. And great. Um, okay. Well, here. Um, you seem to have a line in common in, in uh, your two last tests. You mean this line? Yes. You didn't put that in a setup method? or? Uh, in fact, I can't because only those two tests require a bookmark to already exist in the repository. And the first one is uh, creating the same bookmark. So mm -hmm. if I put that in a setup, the first test will fail. So okay. I have to keep it that way. Um, well, maybe I can show you something. Uh, yes, go ahead. So here, yes, so you just said that these two tests uh, seem to share a common uh, precondition or prerequisite. So uh, maybe I can take those two and put them inside uh, another class. So it will basically represent this uh, this shared uh, context. So it's when a bookmark is already saved in my uh, repository. So I'm going to paste it here. And now that uh, these two tests are uh, isolated, I can take <coughs> this line. So here, and I can actually put, the, uh, put it in a setup method here, because it's not going to be applied to this okay, one. It's right. coped to the inner class. Yes. So uh, this was not working uh, in Genit 4 before, because the uh, engine was not um, able to discover those tests. But now I can say, OK, this is a nested class, and uh, it's going to discover them as well. So if I run this you will see that I still have my two uh, tests. And there is some kind of nice uh, indentation here, which is um, symbolizing my shared context. OK, fine. But it seems that, uh, remember the display name uh, generation strategy, it doesn't apply on the name of the class. Uh, oh, that's because it's a uh, camel case. Yes, well, you can actually uh, put a display name on the class as well. So it's working on both. Uh, Methods and classes. Okay. If you want it to be uh, super pretty. But I can't do that automatically otherwise? Well, you can uh, implement your own uh, generation strategy if you want to. So. Oh, okay. Fine. <coughs> Great. Um, it's okay for that test, I think. Mm, yeah, I think we are good here. We just have one left. Uh, great. So, okay, it's a Spring Boot test once again. And I have to change the runner into uh, an extension, right? Uh, yes, but here I think you don't even have to do that because um, if you look inside the Spring Boot test annotation, I think. Uh, it's already, yes, it's already registered here. Okay. Uh, and by the way, you can see that uh, meta annotation are now supported in JUnit 5. So if you want to create your custom, uh, your own uh, annotations like that, uh, you can put JUnit 5 annotation on top of it. Yes, so it was not possible in JUnit 4, I remember that. Mm. So it means that we can just get read, get rid of that. Uh, I would just like to make sure I'm using the right package for the tests. Yes. OK. And uh, just have a question here. Why are you using the test context? You mean uh, that? Yes. 
or let me remember this. So here we have an integration test of our bookmark controller. <coughs> Uh, in the first test, um, okay, I'm calling uh, the bookmark endpoint to create a bookmark, testing I have the right status. Yes. Okay, in the second one, I'm bootstrapping a uh, bookmark. I'm, okay, I'm checking that I can't create the same bookmark twice, because mm -hmm. this is uh, yes, a business sense. rule. And in the last one, okay, I'm just retrieving the bookmark. I think it's because since I can't create the same bookmark twice, I have to make sure that between each of those tests, the Spring repository will be erased. I mean, all the whole context. Okay. Otherwise, I will have some troubles. Um, but uh, don't you have a performance issue with this? Like, since it's going to recreate the context uh, uh, several let's times? Let's see that. I'm not sure. Should be pretty slow. Um, let's see. Okay, there is a kind of overhead between all those tests. I assume it's because yes. it's creating again and again the spring context. Um, maybe we can do something for that. Oh yes, it seems that only those two tests require the bookmark to already exist. Maybe I can use the nested test you just show me to gather them. Um, maybe we could, <laughs> but here I feel that we are uh, facing a different use case. So it seems that uh, you're simulating some kind of user workflow. Like it could be a real test, uh, I mean, a real life uh, scenario. Yes, it simulates the user consumption of our API. Yes, so maybe instead of uh, trashing your repository every time, you could in fact uh, keep it and build your other tests uh, on top of it. like keep the bookmark you're creating in the first test test, and reuse it. But the thing is, uh, I'm not sure we will know when a test will be executed. As you can see here, it doesn't yeah. correspond to what the order I have in the file. Yes, well, now you can. Okay. Uh, there is a, uh, an order annotation uh, you can use to enforce uh, the, I mean, the order of your tests. So here uh, we want this one to be executed first. So I'm going to put an order here and I'm going to say uh, this is the first one. Um, I can do that for every test. So I can say this one will be second, uh, etc. But here I only care about this one really. To be executed first? Yes. But so if you don't put order on the other one, it means that they will be executed <laughs> after in any order? Yes, okay, exactly. Great. So, um, okay. So now that we can uh, we keep <coughs> this bookmark, we can actually remove uh, this. Oops, this initialization, right? Yes. And this one as well. So less less code. It's, uh, uh, it's now it's better. focused to what it has to test only. <coughs> yes. So I can remove this dirty context. Uh, and I just have to use a uh, test method order here to say uh, to Jnit how I want to order my test. And here I want to look at the order annotation I just put. So um, I can run my class and it should be uh, working fine and also be much faster. Yes. Oh uh, yes, seems that there is less overhead between the tests. And you can see that the first one is always uh, the creation one. Okay, yes. So that is interesting when you have a lot of integration tests and you are you have some perform uh, let's say build time issues. Uh, I think it's okay to do that here because as we said, we simulate kind of natural uh, user consumption. There is a workflow between all of those endpoints. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is, I think, a drawback. Uh, for example, if the first test is failing, the others will be still executed and will fail. Yes, that's an issue. Uh, okay. So since we are doing kind of end-to-end -end tests here, it seems to be okay, but we shouldn't do that on unit tests. Yeah, of because course. Because unit test has to be isolated. Of course. Uh, fine. Wise words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here I could show you some something else if you want. Yes, yeah, show me. Um, so I see that you're using uh, Spring Beans here. Uh, you're yes. You're injecting 
injecting them as a field. So now uh, you can inject them directly uh, through your test method, like this. Mm. You just have to put an auto wire here, and uh, it will be working magically. Isn't it great? Uh, yes, because you know, sometimes just for a test, we need a spring bean. Oh, it's working. And we have to put that as a global attribute. So now we can, you know, do some fine. Uh, yes, we yes, can inject it uh, at the. Where I need it. Yes. Exactly. But it means also that Spring has done something in. Do you need to be able to inject its own bin to test um, it? Well, it's actually a genit feature. Okay. So uh, it's a concept which is called a parameter resolver, which allows you to uh, well inject a, an object uh, into your test method. And uh, Spring only uh, implemented uh, implemented this uh, API. But what's great here is that uh, this API is not only um, made for frameworks, you can also implement it yourself. Oh. So, so that can be interesting. So you mean that with the new parameter resolver, I will be able to, able to uh, directly inject my own object without Spring? Yes. Like, like that? Can, exactly. Oh, can you show me that? Through in testing. Of course. Uh, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, so here you want to inject a bookmark, a bookmark, payload. bookmark payload. So let's uh, create... Which is not a spring bin. Oh. Of course. So let's create a class, which uh, I'm going to call bookmark payload resolver. OK, so I have this uh, API I was uh, talking about, which is a parameter resolver. Yep. So it has two um, methods that I have to implement. Uh, the first one is the condition on which my uh, resolver will be applied. So here, uh, we only <coughs> want it to be applied for uh, bookmark payloads. So I can check the context of my parameter, get it, get its type, and um, be sure it's the right type. Yes. Okay. So in this one, I'm going to have to provide the value I want to inject uh, in my test. So I guess I'm going to reuse uh, this one. Yes, please. <laughs> so I can uh, remove the initialization. I like deleting code. Uh, and here, I'm going to paste it like that. So uh, this is all. So the parameter is uh, implemented. And now we only have to register it on our uh, test class. So I'm going to do it this way. So you are so registering the bookmark payload resolver. OK. And OK, so now if I uh, run the test again, I have deleted the initialization of the object. But it should be working uh, fine. Oh, great. That's a really cool feature because sometimes, you know, when you are doing some domain driven design development, mm -hmm. you don't want Spring in your domain. Yes, of course. Otherwise, you are not doing domain driven design. And uh, it could be a pain when you want to inject things in your tests. And now we can do it in a built in way with Genit. Yes, that's quite awesome. And the other thing which is great here is that we are decoupling the tests from the way we are building the data for the tests. So yes, that's great. But there's something here. Uh, yes, it's there. Uh, in the last test, I'm using a special value of a bookmark payload to generate an error on my backend. You see, to get a bad request. Um, mm -hmm. If I want uh, this bookmark payload to be a parameter of the test, since this is another value, I have to create a new parameter resolver. Um, well, you don't have to. Uh, you can actually reuse the one we just created. So you have to uh, inf inform it you are going to need it, uh, need a different bookmark. So you can put an annotation here. Uh, let's say invalid. OK, a custom annotation. Yes, so I'm going to implement it. Uh, it only have, has to be descriptive. 
So I just have to make sure it's gonna uh, stay until runtime. Okay. Time. And now I can, okay, I'm gonna take this uh, special bookmark. I'm gonna remove this. Uh, and I just have to go back uh, inside the parameter resolver. And here you see that I have access to the context of the parameter. So I can check if the parameter is annotated with anything. So in, in this case, I'm interested uh, in the invalid annotation I just created. And here I'm going to return a different type of, of bookmark, which is going to be uh, this one. OK, fine. So now that I have uh, provided the right bookmark, I can go back here and it should still work. Yes. I hope. I'm never lying, so <laughs> it's working. And that's working. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's really fine because, I, like I said, sometimes the, the way we are building the data <coughs> can be complex. And so now we can share it uh, by putting that in a parameter resolver that we will. Yes, you can reuse it uh, yes. everywhere. But there's something here. Uh, when you register that parameter resolver, you use extend with. I ah, thought yes. it was uh, reserved for extensions. Well, what I didn't tell you is uh, that a parameter resolver is in fact an extension. Okay. So um, basically, extensions are a set of APIs that are provided uh, <coughs> by JUnit. So you can uh, implement them like we just did. Uh, so it's, it allows you to uh, adapt the framework uh, for your testing needs. Okay, great. And if I need uh, this to be, um, you know, if I have several tests that need uh, this uh, bookmark payload resolver, I have to copy past to uh, extend with everywhere? Um, yes, but if you want to really use it everywhere, you can uh, register it globally. So you remember uh, the Surefire plugin here where we put uh, this. OK, sorry, I forgot something. Um, so you have to create a file in your resources folder. Meta Inf services with, with a really complex name. Yes, exactly. So here you will have to provide the list of all the extension you want uh, to register globally. So uh, here. Uh, you want the bookmark. Payload resolver, OK. You have to put the whole the whole name. And now uh, you can go to the Maven Surefire plugin to enable the detection of this um, file, like this. OK. So I guess now we can remove the. Yes, we can go back here. Oops. Oops. And can remove the yes, registration local registration and it should still work uh, that's really great so they have made a lot of things to make uh, the framework you need to be easier to use yes there is such powerful feature now with the parameters over and so on uh, the parameterized test is way simpler to use as yes well. there is a lot of new things that's great cool things and uh, well what is really important to remember here is uh, the extensions. So really, the, the goal here was to uh, open the, the framework to, uh, so now you're, you are able to uh, implement a then, lot of okay. thing. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, extension. Uh, I just showed you the uh, bookmark, uh, excuse me, parameter the resolver. parameter resolver one, but there is uh, a lot more. So, for example, you can uh, plug into the life cycle of your test. Uh, you can deal with uh, exception. You can um, execute your test on a specific condition, <coughs> etc. So that's oh. uh, kind of uh, so useful. That's interesting. Maybe we can use the execution condition on the on the tests. Uh, can you show me how it works? Well. <laughs> Maybe uh, now that you have the, the basis, you can go read the documentation and do it yourself. 
So yes, you can. Uh, so you yeah. have access to the user guide, which is uh, really. Um, I, mean, I, I will definitely read the things. documentation now. Yeah. Okay. okay so thank you very much, Juliette. Uh, thank so you. Let's thank introduce you for yourself. Your attention. Uh, so my name is uh, Juliette Dorancourt. I'm um, a consultant for Carbon IT, which is a French company, uh, and uh, I. Uh, I've been uh, recently contributing to JNIT5 as well. She's a JNIT member. Uh, and I'm also, my name is Julien Topsu, and I'm technical director at the Société Générale, French Bank. And you can find the repository here. Um, so you if you have any question. Yes, feel free to ask. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So. Any questions? Yes? So for the controller, I think that when the second test fails after the before the order one, the build run, if you only run the failed test, will do the order one before? So, uh, uh, can... The last time you opened... So can you repeat that, please? Yeah, so the, the integration test... Yes, for the controller. If the second one after the order uh, fails, and you only want to rerun the failed test, ah. will it run the one that's in order before? Oh, no. no I'm not sure about that. You so the question run. was, if, for example, the second test was failing in here, yeah. uh, and we try to rerun it only, like that, for example, will it uh, rerun the first test before? And the answer is no, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I don't think but, so. Um, <clears throat> as we said, uh, this is so yes. No. This is no. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, live demo. So yeah, that's a bit of an issue here. So, do you have any other questions? Yes. Yes. No, uh, it does not have to. Uh, oh, in here. So the question uh, is, uh, when we are using MetaSource, uh, do we still have to uh, uh, make the method which is actually generating the test cases a static method? Mm, let's try it. So let's <laughs> try, because we don't know, actually. <laughs> But let's I see. thought we were uh, talking about the before all and after That was your question, right? So okay. no. So no. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? So if you're using a parameter resolver, what will be the easiest way to know uh, from where the parameter comes? Yes. Uh, well. So I'm not sure it will be quite easy. Um, I know that they will be ordered. And, uh, I don't remember what will be the method Genit will use to order those parameter resolver. And this is the, the first one which is supporting the parameter that will actually uh, uh, return the value. But you, I, don't know, uh, I don't know if it's predictable or not. Maybe it's written in the documentation. Because you can have several parameter resolver that can be applied to the parameter. And it depends uh, where it is in the list of the parameter resolver that has been built by Genit framework. I don't know how they resolve the parameter resolvers. So, okay. any other questions? One left? I don't see. No, it's okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much.